everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, it's wonderful for me to have the honor and the privilege to uh, welcome the great, incredible, prolific Nuruddin Farah. And I'm going to give a longish in introduction, just if some of you are not familiar with his extensive uh, <clears throat> you know, set of writings. So he's a novelist, essayist, and my favorite thing, he's a master of the trilogy. Uh, and is one of the most important contemporary authors working today. He very early on won the prestigious Neustadt Prize for Literature, and that's just one among several um, such accolades that he has collected. His writing career spans more than five decades, and he has published 13 novels, dozens of essays and plays, and all of these critically reflect on various dimensions of Somali history, culture, and politics. Um, Farah wrote his first novel, From a Crooked Rib, in 1970, and he hasn't looked back since. Um, he has penned three trilogies. The first one was called Variations on the Theme of African Dictatorship. Then came the Blood in the Sun trilogy, and then the Past Imperfect trilogy. And now we are eagerly awaiting the third book of his fourth trilogy, which hasn't been titled, I think. Um, and I think what's important to know here is that each trilogy engages completely new uh, literary styles. And to date, uh, he's one of the very few writers uh, with a truly incredible literary and formal agility and a capacity to keep innovating every time he writes uh, his books. Um, and I'm thrilled to welcome him here to Oslo, even though I'm not <laughs> from here. His uh, last novel, North of Dawn, uh, came out in 2018 and was set in Oslo and engaged with the tragedy uh, at Utoya. And I believe it's going to be translated in, into Norwegian within a year or so, so it's a perfect time to welcome him. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to start, um, you know, at the beginning. So you published your first novel, From a Crooked Rib, in 1970. That's over 50 years ago. You were only 25 years old. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about how you became a writer? I've heard that your mother was a poet and that you came from a sort of community that really, um, you know, cared about education. You were also a teacher. Uh, how did you how did you get into writing? Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back in Oslo. <coughs> how did I start writing? That's a very big question. Well, there is, a, there is a proverb that says, every journey begins with the first step. There were different stages of my life when I attempted to do some writing. And by writing, I do not mean sit down mm -hmm. and write something, but the mm -hmm. idea of putting things down on paper. One of the first things that I remember was that English being my fourth language, mm -hmm. one of the first things I remember was reading Crime and Punishment in Arabic. al Jarima wal Aqab. And the thing that struck me at that time, I was reading about you know, 10, 11, I had an older brother who did not like that I was very, very restless. Either I had a ball which I was kicking around and <laughs> breaking glasses, or I was moving around. So to make me calm down, one of the things he did was he would give me big books, like Tolstoy's, <laughs> <laughs> what is it called, War and Peace yeah. or Love and War. 
war and peace or Dostoevsky's, you know, uh, crime and punishment. And the idea was, and the, there was an Arab uh, translation of some of the other books that I would also read. And an Egyptian novel is called Ihsan Abdul Quddus. The idea my brother had in his head was to give me the biggest book that he could find so that I would sit down and the condition was, if I finished that book, came and told him the story of the book, he would give me a gift. That's the way I earned my pocket money. That's the way I earned gifts from him. It did give me the purpose of sitting down. It did give me the purpose of not being as restless because I knew that at the end of it, I would get something good. So that's one thing that happened to calm me down. The second thing that happened was in the the other thing that happened was the English language books that we used at school had stories. Mm -hmm. And the stories were, you know, let's say about one cat and nine rats. <laughs> what the one single cat would do would be that one cat would wait in a corner for one stray rat and would catch it and take it and eat it. So in the story, these nine cats or 11 cats, or whatever is left of the cat, of the, sorry, rats, got together to plot against the single, the one cat. And there is a dialogue between the rats. And the dialogue, some of them are wise, you know, statements, and some are foolish statements. So one of the things I did was I looked at my friends, the ones who were bullies and knocked me on the head every time I went past them. I gave them the bad lines. <laughs> and the good lines <laughs> went to my friends who were protective of me because I was the youngest in the class. So that's also another mm -hmm. way. In other words, I saw myself, in a, in a way, I saw myself in literature. Yeah, in a place of power as well. Well, in a place of power and also in uh, punishing. Yeah, uh, punitive power. Yes, punitive <laughs> power, punitive power. <laughs> Later then it became something that I began to fool around. And my first novella, a novella is between a short story and a novel, something in the region of 60, 70 pages, mm -hmm. I wrote when I was 18. Okay. From then on, and because I was, you know, this was translated into a number of languages, a short story of mine, was translated into Greek, into Italian, into Arabic, into all these things when I was uh, not even at university. Mm -hmm. That gave me encouragement. Yeah. And that has continued. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the beginning. Yeah. But there is one other thing that's also part of the beginning. Sure. And power is the beginning. When I was about 10, 11, by this time, my brother had managed to calm me down, and nothing was forthcoming from him. No longer was he giving me as many gifts as he should. He was the oldest brother, so he didn't give me the... And I became again restless. So I started what I called a letter-writing agency. Wow. <laughs> I'm 10, 11 years of age. I had a small table like this. And I wrote letters for people who 
were old enough, as old as my father. They would tell me their stories, and I would write letters for them in English or in Arabic, mm -hmm. and began earning money. One day, a man came to me, and he said that he wanted me to write a letter to his wife. Oh, I worry. He was, he was very angry with her because she... Oh, gosh. <laughs> because she went home and did not come back. And he was very angry with her. So in the letter he said, I want you to tell her to come back. And I'm giving her time <coughs> in which to come back. I want her back in three months. If she does not come back in three months, and at that time, we were living in Kalafo. And had, his wife had gone to Beletwain, which is in Somalia. If she does not come back in three months, I will go to Beletwain, break every single bone of this woman, what? and <coughs> drag her all the way to Kalafo. I was about 10. So instead of writing what he told me, <laughs> I wrote, if you do not come back in three months, you may consider yourself divorced. <laughs> <laughs> when, when she received the letter, she took the letter to the judge of the town and explained that this is a letter written in Arabic, which is good, you know, because Arabic is considered to be mm -hmm. close to holy. And he says that if I do not come back in three months, I may consider myself divorced. And lo and behold, six months later, she got divorced. <laughs> she married another man. The man waited and waited when she couldn't come back. He went back. He came to Ghalafo to find the man, the woman married. And he said, how come you are married? I'm, you're already my husband. Sorry, <laughs> I am your husband. <laughs> What's wrong with you? So they, she showed him the letter that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. He came back, spoke to my father, who was a friend of his. And then my father forbade me to write letters anymore. <laughs> And I've run out of pocket money. <laughs> yeah. So in order to start to continue receiving pocket money, I thought I would continue writing. Yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. OK. I mean, that's a great story. You were very uh, meddlesome and, uh, you know, understood the power of writing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I thought I thought I had the power to misinform or mis <laughs> mis <laughs> to fabricate. miscalculate to, ri to write, yeah. yes. Yeah, yes. no, yes. that's great. Um, and so then English was the viable language to write in. I know you always say it's your fourth language. So I know that Somali at the time was not transliterated, but you didn't want to write in Arabic, even though you were reading all this. I did, I did write in Arabic. I did write in every language I learned. I did write Italian. in Italian and mm -hmm. Arabic and English. But because Somali had no orthography, no script, mm -hmm. until 1972, I had to wait to write in Somali right. in 1972 in October. It was, you know, uh, standardized. And then later, in five months, mm -hmm. I started writing a new novel in Somali okay. called Tolo Watele Ma. And then the novel used to be published once a week, a chapter would be published, oh. and continued writing until one day the censorship board in Mogadishu called me and asked me to explain one of the chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. And being a young, foolish man, I said, 
this is literature. You do not explain. Either you understand it or you don't understand it. <laughs> and so publication <laughs> was discontinued. Oh. And from then on, I stopped writing Somali. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, uh, I never finished the novel that I started writing in Somali. Right. Yeah. Well, we Maybe should retrieve it somehow. Maybe one day. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Uh, and I know you studied in India, in Punjab, for a few years. And that might have also added to the English language sort of engagement, wanting to write more in English, because I assume you were studying in English at the university there. And sometimes I enjoy in your novels, you know, like it's understood in the English language writing. You often make references to Greek mythology, you know, he had the strength of Hercules or something like that, and it's taken for granted. But sometimes in your works, I find references to like a Hindu goddess or something. So, you know, which is kind of changes the lexicon a little bit. Um, and I, you know, just wonder about the influence of those years spent in India. Well, by the time I arrived in India, mm -hmm. I was 20, 21. And therefore, in one way, I was already formed. Mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. And many people who knew me at that time, because the scholarship was given to me at the age of 19, mm -hmm. many people who knew me at that time did not think that it was wise of me to go to India. And nearly everyone, including my older brothers, thought that I would benefit from going to America mm -hmm. to study journalism and literature because I had a scholarship to go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Oh my gosh. And, and then you so chose India? In place of going to America, I did not like going to America, and yeah. I'll explain to you a very silly couple of silly <laughs> incidents that, that happened in Somalia at that time. Some Somalis had gone to America and Italy and Germany because there was no university at the time in the country. And they came back, and like in the days of COVID, they used to carry uh, small little bottles full of alcohol and therefore, every time they shook hands with people in Mogadishu, they would clean their hands and say, germs, germs, because they came from Europe or America. Okay. And the idea of carrying a small bottle full of alcohol and cleaning my hands with alcohol every time I greeted a Somali okay. made me feel very silly. Yeah. And I thought, if I go to India, nearly everything is germ full. Absolutely. <laughs> Proudly, the Indians. And if I survive India, if I survive <laughs> the germs in India. You'd have a great immune system. I would have a great <laughs> immunity system, which I still do. Yeah, touch wood. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we spoke about this before, but you know, I know that, you know, the U.S. probably the top of the list for people thinking very racist towards Africans, black and brown people. But India, top of my list of mistreating <laughs> and being very anti-black. So I always wondered if you kind of had those terrible encounters because, you know, uh, it still goes on. It's still kind of, um, it's still so ingrained in the way in which within Indian culture? Well, it didn't affect me. Right. <coughs> it didn't affect me. There was emotional standardization of racism, mm. if you want to call that. <coughs> Having been brought up a Somali, and as every child, Somali child who's sitting in this room would know, <laughs> Somalis are brought up to believe that they are the best looking people, the most intelligent. Factually true. <laughs> and so when I went to India and I discovered that people were being racist towards me, I said, don't they know where I come from? 
And this is one of the reasons why it didn't, it didn't affect me. And the reason is because every time they were racist, I would look at them and say, look, somebody needs to tell them. I am a Somali. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and already having exercised so much power in your hometown with the writing, you were all powerful. Well, but you know, <laughs> No, 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 but I uh, honestly, what you mean. honestly, I do not, I do not easily, I don't succumb to racism. I can understand somebody disliking me for <coughs> some reason or another. But somebody playing racist games with me, mm. it doesn't make sense because I, I told you, you know, from the age, from a small age, I was told. You're the greatest. Wheel coffee and Michiru, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which means? There is. No one better than you. Wonderful. Every mother, you know, Somali words of endearment, mm -hmm. Somali words of endearment are the most beautiful words of endearment. And yet Somalis are also have a very, very sharp tongue. Mm. And so they could go either way from one second to the other. The mother who is saying to her child, my sweetest child, next time she could say, you are the stupidest idiot that God has created. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, w we survived all this. Yeah. And to survive that and then go to India and survive the germs. Yep. <laughs> Omniscience. All powerful. Uh, yeah, I know. And then I think there is a Somali nicknaming tradition that can get very... Vicious, like somebody gets a <laughs> nickname and it's very honest and very intense. And I think in some of your novels, you will sometimes name people a certain way, someone with one foot or like, you know, like just somewhat rude and <laughs> well, but interesting. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, the same, <coughs> the same is true in India. Sure. Uh, you have Langare, which is obviously. <laughs> Langara. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> which is also in Somali, Langare. Yeah. It came from the north, and mm. we, we in the south have accepted okay. Langare. Yeah. Um, okay, I have another question. Well, I have many. But um, so you only write about Somalia and Somalis. At this point, you've probably lived outside of Somalia more than you've lived within Somalia. Have you been tempted to write about lots of other places and topics? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, is Somalia your stubborn focus or a natural and organic flow in your work? Well, every time I have set a story somewhere else, mm -hmm. often I remind myself mm -hmm. the fact that although I have now lived in Cape Town for 25 years, I tell myself, Obviously, this is not quite true, but I tell myself everything that I know about South Africa mm -hmm. could be put on the back of a postcard. In other words, very little. This is not the case, mm -hmm. but that's the way. My starting point is I need to know a lot more mm -hmm. than I already know before I write about it. That's one. The second thing that's also very, very important to remember is that people take ownership of the country from which they come. Sure. And therefore, even if you have not made a mistake by writing about somebody else, let's say you write a beautiful article, you misspell the name of someone. Mm -hmm. Misspell the name in such a way that it gives a different meaning to the name. Somalis who read the article would look at it and say, what does he know? <laughs> he doesn't even know the difference between bar and bar, you see? Because one of them has double R, double A, mm -hmm. the other one has one A, and so on and so forth. So one has to be very cognizant of the fact that you can't get away with mistakes. You could have a beautiful book. You make one little mistake, the local person, the Norwegian, the Danish, the whoever you've written about, would say the most terrible things about that book mm -hmm. because they found one mistake. And if ordinary people find one mistake, you're in terrible situation. If scholars find one mistake in your book, they turn it into a PhD. 
So you have to continue thinking about 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 all this. Mm -hmm. The the other thing, obviously, is the ownership is quite important. Now, I am a Somali. It's possible that I may not have lived in Somalia mm -hmm. for close to 50 years. I continue writing about it. Why? Because I know that even if I make a mistake, my mistake would be an honest mistake. And even if I make a mistake, it would not a Somali in his right or her right senses would not say this person doesn't know Somali. Mm -hmm. They could probably say this person doesn't have the anthropology of that particular thing. You know, in 2011, a kilo of sugar didn't cost $5. It cost $2. Somebody could argue right. about that. But when I write about sugar and the cost of sugar, I would not identify how much. Mm -hmm. I could say... The sugar, sugar was cheap, or sugar was expensive. That way, you can avoid somebody attacking you anthropologically sure. and, and saying this. Mm -hmm. So one of the other reasons is Somalia is an open field. You know, there mm -hmm. aren't many writers okay. hiding in trees, <laughs> doing <laughs> all kinds of other things. And therefore, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Somalis also, because they, they like certain books, and they hate certain books, <laughs> and they tell me why they hate certain books. Somalis don't like you to talk about sex. They do it all the time. <laughs> Just not in a book. But they don't like you to talk about it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Um, to develop this idea, right, writing about Somalia and Somalis, um, and you're often described as a writer in exile, and I think you were exiled. No, I'm in not. In some way. Not anymore, but never. In at some point. No, never. Okay, good. Because uh, when I left Somalia, except for the years that I lived in Rome mm -hmm. and in England, I spent a great deal of my time in one African country or another, mm -hmm. which means that the houses in the townships in Cape Town, the townships in Nairobi, and the houses in Mogadishu, they're almost the same. Mm -hmm. People have the same pre-industrial level of education. And therefore, even though I was not physically living in Somalia, I was living in Africa where the same problems mm -hmm. occurred. Yeah. Sure. And that's why I always said I am not in exile in the way uh, an African living in London, waking up every single day in London, mm -hmm. even in Tower Hamlets or wherever you want to call it, these people sometimes lose touch with the continent. Sure. I am in continuous touch with the continent, and I have been in touch with the continent. That's one. The second thing is to produce, in inverted commas, produce or write literature. There is certain knowledge that you do not need to have. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have a situation based on an everyday if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is you need a generic understanding of the situation. Uh, the con do you need to know the contours of your narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you can follow that, yeah. because you're not writing specifically about a Somali when you're writing a novel. Mm -hmm. Even though the story may be about a Somali, you're writing about a universal subject because Somalis share the problems of difficulties with finance, children difficulties. You know, Somalis who are 10 years old, I was pleasantly surprised 
that this evening I saw young Somalis who came with their mothers mm -hmm. to do that. Because you really, Somalis, when they reach the age of 10, 11, they don't want to have anything to do with their parents because they want to go and play. Soccer, <laughs> play, go around, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very important to know that writing sociology, mm -hmm. writing anthro about anthropology, is different from writing literature. Sure. Let me push a little more on that. So what's very unique about your work and challenging for literary criticism and academics is that you produce your novels about the latest, most updated political events in Somalia, sometimes just a few years later. Um, and in fact, the past Imperfect Trilogy links and so on, uh, we're talking about you know, Black Hawk Down. And over the years, you've continually um, engaged with the event that just happened a few years before. So in a way, it's, it's unusual to kind of actively take on, use literature, um, to take on the role of historian or like journalist political scientist. Um, so I just, you know, and I think like a lot of writers, many writers will actually defend themselves and say, no, I'm not a historian, I'm not a uh, political uh, thinker, I, I just produce art or so on. But you actively engage all these roles. And I just want you to say, say more, you know. How do you well, feel, uh, perceive yourself? Despite, despite, so you see, I am, uh, well, I'm a contradiction in, in a number of ways. But the other thing is to be able to have to tell a story that stands on its own mm -hmm. but makes references to different situations. To give you an example, my trilogy on African dictatorship mm -hmm. has now produced no less than 20 PhDs from different aspects, students of literature, students of political science, students of history. Absolutely. And the reason is, uh, and here, uh, you will forgive me because I don't want to, uh, you know, say very many pleasant things about my own books or praise them. But nearly everyone comes and hopefully takes a wealth of information that's there for them to use it in whatever capacity or yeah. you know whatever mm -hmm. they. They, 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 they like. Uh, and because I do not separate those categories. Categories, yes. yes. I do not say this is sociology, this is anthropology, and so on and so forth. But I'm continuously aware of where these things sit. And the question that I have never been able to answer despite reaching uh, uh, my age is when does a text once written, when does it become literature? Mm -hmm. I haven't quite worked uh, that one out. In mm -hmm. other words, when I publish a book, it's usually put in the literature section. Yeah. I do not know if that is correct, except I know that a book of mine called Maps used to be put in the Maps section. <laughs> Yeah, so v very few actual maps in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. No, yeah, I understand. And, I then, and then the other thing that was quite interesting, uh, when I published Sweet and Sour Milk. My favorite. Uh, Somalis would take the names of the characters and they put them in one column. And then against them, they would write the people who I, whom I am supposed to have based my story on. Even though I'd never seen these people, I don't know who they were. Mm -hmm. Because these people met a certain char characteristics 
mm. they fit that particular yeah. idea of, of Somali. Yeah. Uh, and even my first novel, From a Crooked Drip, I happened to be once in a small town in Somalia called Beledwain, visiting uh, an uncle of mine. And then sitting in a bar in Beledwain, a woman comes and says, the story oh. of the novel is her story. Wow. And therefore I should share the royalty with her. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and did you? <laughs> yeah. There is a, there wasn't enough for me, so there was nothing yeah. <laughs> for me for me to do. I like the audacity of this woman. Sure. It's great. Sure. Um you know, now after almost forty years or so of uh producing works based in Somalia? 50 years. No. And more. Around, at the 40 year point, your books left Somalia, not Somalis, there were still Somalis in them, but they left Somalia and Hiding in Plain Sight was published and it was set in uh, Kenya and then North of Dawn, set right here in Oslo. Um, and like in a symbolic sense, are you sort of admitting that Somalia as a nation is not, as a place is no more kind of functional for you that Somalia is now shaped by the vast diaspora scattered across the planet. I mean, so many places. No. Has something shifted in your thinking? No, not at all, not at all. Somalia came to a different stage in its history, to a different stage in its history. And then it stayed in that stasis, mm -hmm. moving neither forward nor backward, because the Civil War turned it into a non-functioning, uh, well, uh, yeah, a, sure. a, a failed state. Yeah. Uh, I could continue going back to it and doing research but I doubt very much if there was any change. Mm -hmm. Because the stories, you need an engine to move the story. And if you could not find something new to say about the place, mm. I felt there was nothing. Sure. You know, that's one. The second thing that's also very important is that the Somalis who live abroad yeah. are Somalis. Mm -hmm. Even these who live in Norway and who are Norwegian citizens, quite often when they wake up in the morning and look at their faces in the mirror, they're Norwegians. They're Somali, sorry, not Norwegian. Yeah, bo both they become Norwegians later on when they are interacting with Norwegians. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Because Somali is a Somali first. And it's because of that mm. that Indian racism did not affect me. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but you had you realized that it was time to kind of address those. Well, and then I'm going back because if Somalia changes and Shabab is beaten and thinks the story moves on, mm -hmm. I will be able to go back to Somalia. But yeah. but what I'm saying is the Somalis, <laughs> it's it's that story. Yeah. That 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 moves me. Sure. Uh, and because Somalis here also have the right mm -hmm. to be written about. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why I wrote the novel about uh you know, set in Oslo. In Oslo. There are similarities, although Norwegians may not agree with me. There are similarities in a lot of ways between Somalis and Norwegians when it comes to migration. About three, four hundred years ago, yeah. this country was very poor, and especially in the mountainous regions. Mm -hmm. It was also a colony, Danish colony. It also, you know, if you're in the rest of the Scandinavia, terrible things are said about the Norwegians. And my heart goes out to the Norwegians more often than I admit. But 
the important thing is, in terms of migration, the Norwegians, it's as if they have never learned about their own history enough to know to welcome other people. Other people who sit in the empty chairs, because there are empty chairs. Why? Because many of the Swedes, many, sorry, of the Norwegians have left the country from Trondheim, from other places in the mountainous regions where they were poor. And these people, a number of them were fishermen. When they ended up in North Dakota, they became farmers. Mm. When Somalis arrived here, they didn't have a job that gave them the possibility of working in, 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 in Norway. So these are some of the things that th the novel touches on migration and immigration. Mm -hmm. And as, what's his name, uh, Entensberger's book, Europe and Eu Europe, Europe. I don't know if you know, if you know the book. Uh, whenever there is an empty space, if you come into a train, into a, you know, one car on the train, and you find every seat taken except the one empty seat, you think you are entitled to that one empty seat. But, okay. So you say, is this empty seat taken? You speak to the people in the car mm -hmm. who got there before you, let me begin the story from okay. the beginning. Let's imagine a train is leaving Oslo and it's on its way to where? Trondheim. <laughs> <laughs> One person goes in, he's a scholar, he has his books, he puts them down, spreads, marking papers, students' papers, so some of the papers are there, and then he takes one of the papers, corrects, and then he puts them on the other side. He continues. A second passenger comes. There is space. He sits opposite, because there are empty seats. Sure. By the time the third one comes, the two people who got there first claim ownership of the car, the spaces in the car. Mm -hmm. Because you have to ask these people, is this seat empty? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So the Somalis did not come and say, are these seats empty? They came because they were refugees. In the same way as the Norwegians who went to North America did not ask for permission. They were encouraged to go to America. Ask yourself the question, what kind of land did the Norwegians who finally ended up in America or Canada, what kind of land did they get? The Americans would kill, massacre millions of North American Indians. Their land, mm -hmm. which now belonged to the state, the murderous state that killed all these people, that land would be given to the Norwegians. And they would pay 75 cents an acre for land that belonged to the North American Indians who were massacred. So what I'm saying is there are stories that are worth reading about and understanding about migration uh, you know, and probably it's not my place, but I think uh, the school curriculum must spend some time on explaining the history of, Norwe of, of Norwegian migration to the younger generation so that they know why they are mm. who they are today. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
you know, I promised you some critical questions. So you're right at the point where you're really talking about the history of colonialism, erasure of indigenous people and accommodating uh, European settlers and things like that. And you are a writer that came up during the same time as, you know, all the greats that are just as reputed and prolific as you, Gugi Wationgo, Chinua Chebe, uh, Ama Ata Aidu, all your age, you know. Um, and all of them are sort of staunch anti-colonialists and they have spent, you know, a lot of energy and engagement thinking about the pernicious effects of colonialism on the countries they come from, including dictatorships, coups, uh, all kinds of failed state type of things, if you want to call it. But sometimes when I read your works, I don't necessarily feel you take a very, you're very invested in a kind of anti-colonial mode. Sometimes you may even appear nostalgic for some past time, you know. Really? Yes, like the Italian, you know, there's some Western, some sort of, um, I don't know, some sort of kind of... Um, Give me an fond, example. Fondness, Give me an example. Fondness be, of Italian... Um, be, be the scholar that you are and <laughs> give me... Uh, 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 yeah. One paragraph, one book in which I am nostalgic about Not colonialism. I think nostalgic is the wrong word. I think like fondness of a certain type of, so you know, it's also connected to say the shift over time with the way you've portrayed women. I think, you know, one of the things that's very attractive about your works and some of your older works is extraordinary women, independent, spirited, uh, wonderful, we could say feminist, and then in the last few years, something has shifted. You know, you seem annoyed about the religious tendencies. There is a, the representation has shifted, you know. Give me uh, an example again, a character or something. The character You're the scholar, of <laughs> let's hear. <laughs> the character in North of Dawn of the, uh, the mother, and she's so, she's so shrill, you know, she's so um, nasty. I'm forgetting her name. There's the characters, the women that show up, and you you refer to the burkas as as tents, you know. Um, and I feel maybe it's a bit unfair because I think the shifts that have happened over time in Somalia, well, you know, uh, are unfortunate. But it's not necessarily like the women's fault or something. You know what I mean? Well, I am totally and absolutely against the idea <coughs> of certain changes of culture. Mm -hmm. In the sense that I'm against the idea of treating an entire community as one unit. Sure. And if we were to take, for example, my idea about what I call the tent, yeah. <laughs> it's because Somali culture had, Somali women had those beautiful clothes that they wore on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. They walked elegantly, but what happened a bit later mm -hmm. is that the tent covers the whole cloth and therefore you could not see, you could not see the person as yeah. such. You could not see the person as such. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second thing is there is no tolerance on the part of Wilia, mm -hmm. the woman yeah. character. She beats her child, yeah. tortures him. He lives in Norway, tortures him if he brings another Norwegian child to be with him. Mm -hmm. 
she comes from somewhere else, refuses to accept mm -hmm. to live in a place that belongs to someone else and refuses to integrate, refuses to learn Norwegian, refuses to learn everything. Now, these are some of the things that I'm, as a person, not as a writer even, I am against the idea of someone who shuts himself and goes somewhere else and therefore says, mm -hmm. you know, I am going to remain the way they are. There has to be change yep. in people's attitudes. Now, I was once asked in an interview, what were the things that Somalis have lost in the civil war? And one of the things I said, with Somalis no longer dress the way they used to dress. A Somali woman who is married could be told separated from a Somali woman who is not married. Because Somali women plaited their hair, which is anchory. Now, everything must be covered in a tent. Obviously, that I am against. Yeah. I understand. So for cultural survival, for the sake of cultural survival, I say, can't we be Muslim, remain Somalis? We don't have to change within a short period of time. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And that's all I'm saying. I'm saying I'm, I'm very happy to be Somali, to be Muslim. I am proud of it, but I do not want to become an Afghani in the, the way that I, I put on clothes. That's, what I, that's all I'm saying. So have I, become, have I become cruel? Have I changed simply because I say the clothes that these people wear does not agree with the aesthetics of the Somalis? Because every country, every culture has its own aesthetics. <laughs> the difference between the Somali uh, Guntino, which many people, many young women do not wear, and the sari is the Indian sari, the woman uncovers the middle, mm -hmm. the riff, the middle riff, midriff. The Somali woman, it's on the side. It's open on this side. And they moved quite freely, talked quite freely, noise, everything. Now they don't because they're all, yeah. that I'm not happy about. Yeah, yeah. All I'm saying is that there is. There and and <laughs> I, I want to, if I come into a room, I'm not married now. So if I came into a room, <laughs> so if I came in, into a room and I cannot tell the woman who is married, the woman who is not married, <laughs> I get confused. It hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so you can't accuse me of being unfair to women. <laughs> yeah, I think the clothes are the clothes, and then there is complex, interesting, you know, reasons why those clothes come on, and there is a personhood inside, I guess. And well, I, I don't see the person who is inside. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. That's my problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, we can take uh, questions. We are almost yes. into an hour, yes, so yeah. uh, I'm sure you're going to have flooded with questions. So whoever wants to go, I don't know if there's a mic or yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Anybody? There's a in young the back. person way in the back. If you want me to mention your name, please mention your name. Salaam alaikum warahmatullah. Alaikum Adair. Yes. Uh, great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I have been a fan a long time. Uh, your reading is very interesting. I have a question about the last subject, about religion, about mm. clothes. Somalis have been Muslim for a long, long, long time. And... Uh, yeah, it has been changed in the more conservative uh, ways, but it have always been there in a, in a button. Uh, the thing was, 
to this uh, Seattle regime, or we can call it the Ka'an, or call it uh, Soviet Union time, uh, people was not free to express the religion in the same way as we are in Norway. So maybe your, your thoughts is still connected to, to the 60s, 70s, <laughs> where people uh, still didn't have the, uh, the freedom to express uh, the religion fully. I remember my grandmother using the Guntino in the same way you described now, but uh, I love it, my mother using the tent more this time. So maybe the culture haven't changed that much, but people just got more freedom to express the culture for fully. Can you give us some thoughts about, about that? By the way, I, I love your readings, and you are a Somalian hero. I just need to, to say that. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if the changes in clothing make us more Muslim. I've always said I am interested in the preservation of Somaliness. I have been away from Somalia for a long time, but I have a certain nostalgia for being Somali. That's one. The second thing is I do not know if I agree with you that during the various times one could not express one's religious ideas. There were certain b polemics mm -hmm. during Siad Barre's regime, and the reason is because he was a dictator. But uh, if you compare what's happening in Saudi Arabia now through this man called the MBS, with the initials MBS, who is changing Saudi society from what it used to be to what he wants to become. The debate, in my view, very humbly, is can we remain true to the Somali culture without imitating someone else. That's all I'm saying. You can challenge the view that I have, but the question remains until you answer it. I want the ways and the traditions that made us different you know, I can't remember uh, if anybody remembers the song that used to be uh, uh, Omar, do you remember the the uh, poem that said Gil Sidan o Kala Lord Aldo Gabar Sidan o Ted Anti Mehada? Do you remember the, the, the song? Could you please uh, give us a few lines, the beginning of, of that uh, poem? Yeah. Well, there you are. If you just take that poem and follow it to the letter, I want somebody to follow that particular poem to the letter and say, these are the things that distinguishes Somaliness from other people. All those characteristics have gone now. And my position is, can we revive some of those things without somebody coming and saying, let's kill Nuruddin because he questions religion. I'm not questioning religion. I'm saying to you, we can remain Muslim. We can remain Muslim and Somali without changing all the other things. That's all. Whether I go to hell or not for saying this, that's between God and me. <laughs> yeah. But 
Somalinamada, who he Lugu Gerinchri, wa in the hello. That's all. I'm sorry. Well, could you say it in English or Norwegian or some? Yes. Exactly. And do you know where the, 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 beginning, the beginning of the tent came from? The beginning of the tent came from because in the Civil War, women could not walk about in the Guntino dress, which is very colorful, where you can see the woman's body. What they wanted was to make sure that you could not tell the difference between a beautiful young woman and an old woman. And what the tent does, the tent covers you to such a degree that you cannot tell whether you're married, not married, whether you're human, not human, whether you're a man or a woman. It has nothing to do with Islam. This is a subject that comes up quite often. Yeah. Good. Can we move? He yeah. has a question <laughs> in the front. First, I want to uh, greet you. Thank you. Uh, as I'm uh, your student for 50 years ago, we were in Lafole, Simon, huh. uh, in 1971, 70. So I'm Chama. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah. yeah. So um, I have read your book that time, probably crooked it. <laughs> yeah. And that is a prof Somali proverb, actually, which has you taken this from the crook. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that way when I was in, <laughs> when I was with you in Lafore, and I had uh, shared the same uh, opinion about women in general. <laughs> and, but when I came here to the West, it seems that I have changed my mind about, you know, seeing a woman as, as we saw it in there, when we were there. That they were not only born from a uh, um, crook rib, but they were not created from crook rib, but they are more righteous than us in what, in what I saw in Norway, for example. I have seen all the ministers, the prime minister, and all the ministers have been ladies, you know. Where did this? Uh, you, you understand what I mean? They were. I will f uh, answer it. Could you finish, please? Y yeah. So that the, from the crook rib, we mean when we are there in Somalia that that they they th that women think negatively in every angle we. I don't understand. But I have changed my mind when I came here. How do you see it now? Well, you have to take the context in many different ways. Number one, Somali proverb says, women, God created women from a crooked rib. The other thing is the other half which you omitted is the interesting part. If you try to change it, you break it. Two seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And that is the important thing, you see, because you omitted the other half, which is important, which means leave women the way they are, accept them the way they are, that they are human beings, that they are to be honored, and so on and so forth. Don't touch them. Don't twist their lives. Don't bully them. Don't torture them. Don't torment them. That is what the entire proverb means. And therefore, if, because you have misunderstood the second half of the proverb or omitted it deliberately, then there is something wrong with the way you are interpreting it. God created woman from a crooked rib, but if you try 
to straighten it, you break it. Don't try to straighten it. Leave them the way they are. Let them be free. Let them be humans. Let them everything that they, and this is what the novel is about, you know? Others? Maybe some women asking questions would be nice. <laughs> Well, we have had a lot of discussions, so I will not ask you a question, you know. I have asked all my questions, but I will just add some comments in, in your presentation, how you became a writer. Uh, I don't know if you remember, when we were back from Jigjiga to Deridawa for three years ago, you told me a very beautiful history about how you start writing, and you told me that once you were elected, by the school committee to write an address when Haile Selassie was coming to your school. Why did you forget that part to add in your, <laughs> I mean, inspiration <laughs> when you were talking about your history? Well, I'm now 77 years of age. If I were, if I were to tell every aspect of my life, <laughs> We would be here forever. Mm -hmm. We would be here forever. Yeah. But thank you. Um, yeah. What is that story? What's he talking about? <laughs> Do you recall what he's saying? Well, he. Well, at the age of about eleven, Haile Selassie, the emperor of mm. Ethiopia, came to the small little town in which I was going to school, mm -hmm. and then uh, the teacher to welcome Haile Selassie because the emperor, whether you liked him or not, he was the authority in the country. And other teach students were chosen to give the speech to Haile Selassie. But the majority of them were too afraid to stand before the emperor. Hmm. Huh. I was around 11 and a half. And then the teacher said he wanted somebody to go and speak in front of the emperor. Who has the courage to stand in front of the emperor? So I said, I do. And then uh, I was given the speech to read before the emperor. And because you couldn't hold the paper all the time because Haile Selassie wanted to see your eyes because he was wow. very suspicious of uh, people <coughs> ne wanting to <laughs> kill him or something. I had to learn everything in one and a half minute and repeat the words without holding a piece of paper. Yeah. And that probably also meant that there is an aspect of me mm -hmm. that you know, uh, gained the importance because my photographs were on all the walls in Ethiopia for a while. I mean, as, uh, as, yeah. a, young, as a young person. Uh, wow. But I didn't think that that was, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> that's lovely. Assalamu alaikum, Nuruddin. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Mahat Abdullah. Uh -huh. And I, I grew up in Somalia in during 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I believe those days was one of the best, best in Somali, young Somalis grow when coming to the school, freedom of, you went to uh, different places like Halane, El Chale, you know that place in Marka. And we, we went to 1975, when Somali tried to le everybody learn Somali can write and read. I was a member of the student uh, who went to Bakol. And I also went to India. I can speak Tora Tora Marabi or, uh, <laughs> or Tora Tora <laughs> Indi. <laughs> yeah. And I live in Pune near Bombay, yeah. 300, 150 kilometers from uh, Maharashtra yeah. state in Pune. And my question is, came to this country in 1987. 
um, the question is, when uh, youngest uh, girls, especially here in Norway, women, or you can call girls, are very successful when it comes to university. They graduate, 70% Somali girls are graduate school, nurse, they are uh, social welfare, super, super, uh, uh, works different places. We went to uh, some of us, uh, Mariam, she's in uh, Parliament. But I'm sorry to say that 70 or 80 percent of boys are we failure. I can say some of us. Why do you think girls are successful here in Europe and boys are a little bit failure? Is it home? And the second question is, you tell us in 19, 2012 here in Norway, uh, when we used to, uh, for example, Facebook, I started in 2008, your children have own generation when it's coming to Facebook, and you are a member of them, but you don't look at them, what they do. You just respect them. What about, what's the difference, new, wall, and old school? Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting sociological problem that black African children, West Indian children, uh, Middle East children, children and all this, when they're the male sex, they usually come up against difficulties in the school system. And the reason is because there are, they're up against many difficulties. I have two children one is 27, the other one is 29, who live in, in California. When I read something about a boy who got into trouble, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is, is my son involved? And the reason is because boys are up against a very, very aggressive system from the police and from the authorities in America, in Norway, in everywhere else, especially children with single parents. Single parent children, boys, have difficulties. Why? Because societies, Norwegian, Swedish, Britain, and so on and so forth, all of them, do not know how to manage families, single yes. parent families. The girls usually survive better because the Somali men are usually, usually useless when it comes to looking immediately <laughs> after the interests of the family. Because if the family is complete, in other words, husband, wife, with the children, the children are very likely not to be in trouble. But because of the fact that there have been disturbances within the family system, the boys become casualties of this more often than the girls. When I was a student in England in the 70s, the majority of the boys who were in trouble were West Indian because they had similar situations to the Somali situations in which Somalis are usually single mothers looking after children. You know, in other words, work, very, very hard, the whole day. Mm -hmm. She comes home to cook. She comes home to look after the children. And some of them are left with three, four children by a man 
who sits around somewhere, talks nonsense all day long about politics. <laughs> now, that obviously affects the relationship between the single parents and the boys. Because boys, in inverted commas, we say, we say, or we feel, boys need someone who, another man who talks to them because there is a lot of testosterone that has to be, you know, managed. And the women, unfortunately, many of them, fail to do that. When obviously, it's understandable because, you know. Well, they're working you a have lot four as well. Children. Yes, of course, yeah. of course. I mean, I'm not blaming them for failing in being able to. And then you also, for example, uh, need uh, to be able to have the patience. You can't have patience if you've been working for eight, nine hours, you come home, the, the dirt, the wash, the, sorry, the, the dishes are dirty, the clothes are, and then there is no companion of whatever kind, man or woman, who looks, who helps, who does all this. So that is the reason why uh, and then the system and the police system in Norway, the police system in America are not unkind. Now, my children, why do I bother about this? I bother about this because my former wife took away the children when they were young. And so at that time, early on, I worried about them, about the boy especially, because whenever there was any problem, because the boy, again, testosterone, the boy wanted to show that he's a man. But now he's reached a certain age, and now he's absolutely fine. Girls are usually more serious about boys in terms of education. Girls grow up faster than boys. They become wiser and faster than other, you know. Now, why do I, why did I say maybe 2012 or whenever it was, that I don't very much care what my children do. The reason is, I usually think I was once young, many years ago. I did terrible things that my parents did not know about. I used to smoke, hide it. I couldn't smoke in front of my parents. so. What did I do? I kept it a secret. Somali parents, and especially male parents, fathers, have very little sympathy for anyone growing up. Because you have to be, the society is very tough on children. They're very sweet on children until the age of two. And then after that, they treat it as if they're adults. So we need somebody to come up with the idea of educating the parents rather than the children. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Yes, uh, there was a lady. Yeah. We are running out of time, and this is the last question from Somaya. And then oh, we can, we sorry. Close. We can't make more time? Yeah, Somaya, and then there is uh, okay. uh, so some women in the and front. Then other lady. It's been uh, lovely and interesting to listen to both of you. I was just, yeah, <laughs> some applause is grounded. I have two questions. One is uh, about uh, your writing process or routines. Yeah. And the other is when and how and where do you find inspiration for your writing? Yeah. So may I'm going to add on to that and just quickly ask, do the books come to you singular or as trilogies? I'm obsessed with the trilogy thing. I just think it's unusual. Shall I answer this and then we come to? Yeah. Yes, OK. Well, my life as a, as, a, as a writer is not something that I would want other people to follow. <laughs> and the reason is, I 
I work in a very disciplined way in that my work starts from 8.30 until 5, ideally every day. That's one. The second is I write every book. I write four drafts of every book. It's a very disciplined way of existence. It's very hard on the body and the mind, but I'm used to it. In other words, there are occasions when I don't see anyone, including my friends, when I'm writing. Where do I get inspiration? Well, unfortunately, I'm not the kind of writer who sits somewhere and waits for inspiration. <laughs> what I do is I write. On the first days of a book, I could absolutely write nonsense the entire day and the second day. And on the third day, it's possible I may be able to save one sentence from two days' work. Mm -hmm. And then I build on that. And therefore, there is a certain process to the madness in which I operate. Uh, trilogies. <laughs> I look at every major event as affecting people, different people differently. In a revolution, in a civil war, in dictatorship, take it dictatorship. Dictatorship What does dictatorship do to children is different from what does dictatorship do to the parent who works for the state. Mm -hmm. What does dictatorship do to the woman? Remember, there is a hierarchy in Somali society, and the hierarchy is the man is on top, the woman is middle, somewhere in the middle, and the children are the lowest, in the lowest category. How does dictatorship affect every category of human society? And therefore, every novel would have children, yeah. grandparents, parents, and the relationship between grandparents and children and grandchildren it's a very loving thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because there is no tension between grandparents and the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You see? So, because the, the parent does not feel the necessity to train and torture and do all, ki all kinds of things. Parents have the patience all the time in the world to explain the world to their grandchildren. But when they were parents, <laughs> they didn't do that for their children. That's why I'm interested in the story being told through grandparents. And therefore, in every trilogy, there are children, it's young children, men, there are women, and there are sure. elderly parents. That's lovely. It's a pattern. Yeah, she has a very... It's quick, right? And then he has a very quick, and then that's it. But you can take uh, it together. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> thank you. It's not really a question. It's more I wanted to add something to what um, you said. And what you said also. I agree to the things you say about the male, the boys, how they grow up and how they 
fail in a way. And I think there is another aspect to this is that in a welfare system, um, the, the women can be very independent because she, she can get money from the state and she can survive with that. And the men somehow, they, I think it's in our history or our genes that we, we have certain roles and as a male, he also needs to feel that there is a need for him and there is a work that he needs to do. But in the welfare system, these things get a bit um, out of uh, yeah. um, function. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, because this applies also to uh, Norwegian boys, yeah. you know, the boys somehow they fall and the women they, yeah. They stay, they're, the more, they're stronger. Yeah. Yeah, boys are weaker. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's... Uh, well, I don't know. I don't like Asian, but yeah. 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 But I just want to add that point with Thank the welfare sure. system, which also Thank affects you. the whole system in yeah. a way. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, is yours a question? Ah, okay. Just short, please. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Johan. Thank you very much, sir. I have only one uh, question. It's about Sharaf. About? Sharaf. Sharaf? Sharaf Ona. Yes, yeah. honor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's how can we, in a way, um, what can uh, Sharaf distribute, or uh, how can young Somali people, second generation in Norway, how can they establish or or uh, or keep the sense of Sharaf? Which means. Oh, I see. Well, receiving respect and yes. giving respect. Receiving is, is the important thing, I think, in the, in the. Uh, I will quote a Somali, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a verse from the Quran. The Quran says, اليد العليا خير من اليد السفلى. I'm sorry. It's a hadith. Hadith, he say. It's a hadith. It's a hadith. Okay. <laughs> Tell us what it says. Meaning, the upper hand is more preferable to God than the lower hand. When people are on a welfare system, waiting for gifts to come from the state, and one is not always, does not keep one's own honor, by working the sweat of their life, the person does not have honor. Somalis will become more honored by Norwegian society or by any other society. If they become financially independent, and work very hard in such a way that they are on a par, equal level, with the other members of society. The welfare system creates dependence. And anyone who is waiting, anyone with the lower hand, cannot be considered to have honor. So, now there are more Somalis who are honored or who contain their honor because they work their sweat every day by going to work and going home 
because they have Norwegian friends and they're equal. They think of themselves as equal to the Norwegians. But if you sit in a, you know, somewhere, and at the end of every month you receive, I don't know, 400 krona or I don't know how much, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they receive, then you have a problem because this person has no honor. Somalis, many of them, used to have honor when they were in Somalia because they were the household, you know, the chiefs of the households. They ran their houses. They were the ones who were working, and the women, many of them, would stay at home as housewives, uh, as wives. And that is why uh, now more women are honored because they have worked, they work very hard. Women do miraculous things that men don't do. They don't have the patience the men. The other thing is, of course, men are more interested in politics. Who did what? Who said what? And they gossip a lot, <laughs> talk about politics all, all the time. So there is no honor. <laughs> Am I... Am I making sense? Thank you so much. A massive round of applause, please.